What, what's one of your favorite topics? When you hear a sermon or you read scripture, what would be like your favorite topic? Would it be the miracle stories? You love to read about the miracles because quite frankly, you're a miracle. Would it be the hope stories? Because again, you've seen hope and God's given you hope. Would it be the forgiveness stories? You've, you've been forgiven. Would it be the stories on prayer? Um, again, don't touch anybody, but just turn to the person you're right, turn to the person you're left, and tell them your favorite Bible topic. Take just a second, and what's one of your favorite Bible topics? Take a shot at this. You don't have any? Okay, keep going. Go ahead. Well, I don't know that this was Jesus' favorite, but it's the one that he talked about the most. And so again, this team of young boys gave me, they gave me sex, they gave me money, uh, to, and, and they gave me um, alcohol. So today is, let's be honest, about money. I don't know that this would be Jesus' favorite topic, but it's the one he talked about the most. Jesus talked more about money than he did anything else. In the Bible, there are 2,350 verses on money. 16 of the 33 parables of Jesus deal with your stuff. If Jesus were your preacher, every third Sunday, he would be talking about money. Why? Why? I think it's because he knew we needed a lot of help with this. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not. I did not know this. But there are actually 29 different topics in the Bible concerning money. Now, I want you to look at that for just a minute. 29. So those 22,350 verses can all be squeezed into those 29 different topics. And if you think about this, Jesus would always teach these topics with stories. And so he would start off with a story about a rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler came to him and said, what? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? And, they have, and there's a whole story about the rich young ruler. And it didn't end well for him, did it? Remember that story? He walked away, didn't he? Because he had great wealth. But a, but a more positive story was Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was this, what, greedy little tax collector. And nobody likes Zacchaeus. He's up in the tree. And Jesus says, I must stay at your house today. Remember that story? How many of you went to Sunday school? Remember that story? All right. It's a great story, and Jesus teaches all about rich young ruler, teaches all about Zacchaeus. Then we've got the story of the widow. Remember the widow? Everybody else gave out of their wealth. Jesus is watching them give their offering. That'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it, for me to be watching you give your offering? But Jesus is watching them give their offering, and it says she gave her two, two mites. Then we have a story about talents, and everybody has a lane. And he tells a story about there's one talent, there's two talent, there's five talent people, it's true with you in this room. In this room, we all fit into one talent, two talent, and five talent categories. And then Jesus tells one of the craziest stories. It took me 20 years to understand the parable of the unjust manager. There's a CPA who's ripping off his boss. And it's a crazy story. And Jesus isn't commend, commending the guy for being dishonest, but he was commending the guy for leveraging money. And we have all these stories. So I want you today not to try to get everything we're going to talk about because it's a shotgun and it's a roller coaster and it's fast. Get something. Say, get something. My goal today is to what? Get something. You're not going to maybe get everything. There's way too much. I want to land on a story today about a farmer. And we're all going to relate to this story. And Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12 the story about a farmer who was doing quite well, and his ground produced a good crop. And as you start off with the story, you're going, well, what's wrong with that? And the answer is absolutely nothing. If you're a farmer, you want good crops. If you are a farmer, you want good soil. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the story until we get to the very end. So if you've got a phone and you want to download a Harborside app, if you want to follow along, lots of Scripture today. Again, don't get everything, but get what? Get something. Here's our first story. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Well, that's good. If you're a farmer, you want good soil, you want good seed, and you want what? You want a good crop. 
The, par- the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Again, is there anything wrong with the story so far? Absolutely not. This is a wise businessman. This is a man who's got got it going on. His business is growing. His farm is growing. His crops are growing. He's only got so much land, so he's going to build some bigger barns. So far, I love the story. So far, I'm going, huh? This is a great story. But then he says, "Um, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. This is where the music starts to change. The music starts to change when it now becomes about him. It was no longer about, about his opportunities. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up good things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Jesus is saying it's a great land. It's a great produce. It's great seed, great farm, great crops. That was smart. Tear down your barns. They won't hold enough. Build bigger barns. None of that was the problem. What was the problem? The guy had his ladder on the wrong wall. Every one of us in this room are going to climb the ladder. You need to climb the ladder. God put seeds and vision inside of you. Every one of you wants to climb the ladder. Climbing the ladder is not the problem. The problem is, what, which wall will you put your ladder on? This guy put his ladder on himself. This guy put his ladder on only blessing himself. Now, it's very interesting because the context of this, now we're going to go to to verses before this, say this. How did that whole story get started? Right here. How did the whole story about the rich farmer get started? Right here. Somebody interrupts Jesus in the crowd. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So somebody just randomly shouts out at Jesus They're having a settlement dispute with the family inheritance, and the guy's going, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to divide my inheritance with me. Probably Jesus knew the family. Weren't that many people in that culture. Jesus probably knew the guy. Jesus probably knew the family. And Jesus said, hey, man, Uh, I think that's funny. Man, (laughs) who pointed me? Jesus was cool. He had a little slang going on from time to time, you know, a little Galilean slang. He said, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Now, here's the point for this morning. There's 29 different topics. We're going to look at just one. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Jesus said, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I want to talk about greed this morning. I've never taught on greed before. I've never thought about greed before. I always thought there was one kind of greed. Jesus says there are greeds. There's a plurality. Jesus says, be on your guard against what? All kinds of greed. Did you realize that there's a whole bunch of greeds? I didn't. I never thought about this until about three weeks ago until I started to do this research. Now, in this context, this one guy wants his brother to, you know, uh, have the inheritance split, and, and there was about possessions. But that's not the only kind of greed. So let's talk about this this morning. Say greed. Now, the truth of the matter is greed's an inside job. And greed is not hard to detect Because greed comes out in our words, greed comes out in our actions, greed comes out in our thought. But I want to to say this as we get started this morning, there's not one kind of greed. There's multiple forms of greed. So how do you know if you're greedy? And how do you know if greed is inside of you? Well, I didn't think greed was inside of me until I started doing some of this research. And then I realized that greed hides itself in different pockets of our heart. And even the last three weeks as I've been doing this research on this message this morning, I've had to stop and to repent two or three times during the course of my study. So maybe you don't think you're greedy. I want to ask you this morning to have an open heart 
and let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this so that we can be free. So what happens with greed? Well, greedy people not only want something, but they, they go too far to get it. See, wanting something's not bad. We all want an education. We all want success. We all want good health. We all want things. We, it's not wrong to want things. But the problem is when we go what? Too far. When you go too far to get something. When you're willing to lie. When you're willing to deceive. When you're truthful but you're not honest. It, it's when we decide to take shortcuts. It, it's not that we want things. That's not the problem. Wanting something's not the issue. The issue is we're willing to go, what? Too far to get it. Then there's kind of the opposite side of this. Greedy people do everything they can to get out of work. They, they want other people to work, but they don't, they don't want to work themselves. Greedy people think life is all about them. And this is where arrogance comes into play. And a lot of greedy people, well, I've earned it, and I, I deserve this, and I'm entitled to this, and because I'm so smart or because I'm so successful and therefore I can treat people the way I want and I can talk to people the way I want. And, 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 and so if, if we're not careful, it, it, that, that we can become arrogant. And, and, and the arrogance then spills out and spills over into our lives. Greedy people have, have strong opinions about issues, but they expect others to shoulder the burdens. Mm. Am I relating to anything so far in your life? Or are you D, all the above, okay? Greedy people are first in line to ask for more, but they're the last in line to work to earn their rewards. Greedy people are always trying to basically look for clever ways to outsmart the rules and the regulations. Now, why is this a problem? See, the reason this is a problem, and the reason Jesus teaches about greed, and the reason I want to do this this morning is it entraps you. It causes health problems. Greed will keep you from sleeping at night. Greed will keep you up scheming and dreaming of ways. Greed, greed really keeps us from recognizing who the owner of all the world is. And if you're not careful with greed, you will place your ladder on the wrong building. And you will build your life climbing a ladder that at the end of your life absolutely gets you nowhere. It's kind of like the game of Monopoly. At the end of the game, when you're done playing for two or three hours, what happens? Everything goes back in the box. So here's what Paul says about greed. Let's look at some scripture first. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual morality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Colossians, well, Ephesians says, for this you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. So why, why is greed an issue? Because you begin to worship it. It, begin, it begins to place, take priority in your heart, and there's only room in your heart for one God. There's only room in your heart for one God, and He wants to be the Lord and the God of your life, and that's why it says you can't serve God in money. You have to make a decision. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Scriptures talk 28 other topics. And a whole bunch of the Scriptures talk about work, talk about investing, talk about saving, talks about making really good fiscal financial decisions. You need to do all of that. It's just if this is in your life, it will prevent you from being free. It will entrap you. It will enslave you. It, you will never have the family. If greed is a part of your heart, you'll never have the family that you want. If greed is a part of your heart, you'll never have the freedom that God designed for you to have. If greed is a part of your life, you will never sleep well through the night. And so this is why the Scriptures talk about, don't do this. Colossians says the same thing. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desires, and greed, which is idolatry. That's a weird statement. Greed is idolatry. Basically, greed is saying, I'm going to take God off the throne of my life 
and I'm going to pursue money or whatever possessions or whatever form of greed, that's going to be the, the top priority of my life. Are you still with me? Are you glad you can't got up early this morning to come to church to, to hear about greed? In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with their fabricated stories. And so we, we've got this amazing story, really, uh, in the book of 2 Kings. And this is a story of just in, incredible greed. But let me, let me back up. Naaman has leprosy. Naaman is a Syrian, and he's the commander of the army of Syria. So he, he's the second in command of Syria. He works only for the king. And Naaman now has leprosy, and he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's going to die. Leprosy will kill him. Well, he has a slave girl who's a Hebrew, and she says, go to my land, and there's a prophet in the land who can heal you, and his name is Elisha. Elisha will heal you of the leprosy. So Naaman now goes to Elisha's house. Elisha the prophet doesn't even come out the door. Elisha the prophet doesn't even go greet the great commander uh, Naaman, he sends his servant Gehazi out to the front door. You can just imagine Gehazi goes out the front door, walks down the sidewalk by the mailbox, and there's this, this Syrian commander with chariots and all, you know, 150 soldiers. And, and Gehazi says, all you got to do is go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you will be healed. This offends Naaman, offends him. You didn't even get up, come out of the house, and greet me. I'm ticked. And so Naaman's now driving off his chariot, angry. And one of the servants, I guess, in the chariot says to Naaman, hey, you know, um, what do you got to lose? The prophet's servant said, if you wash seven times in the Jordan River, you will be healed. I mean, if he'd asked you to do something really hard, wouldn't you have done it? And Naaman goes, all right, all right, all right, all right, I'll listen to you. So he goes over there, and he washes seven times in the Jordan River, and he's healed. He's healed of leprosy. And so Naaman goes back then to uh, Elisha's house, and he, again, sends word by a servant and says, I want to pay you. I'm honored. I want to give you a lot of money. I got silver, gold, sets of clothes, and it lists in the Bible all the different sets of, of materials he brought. And Elisha Elisha says, ah, not today. Thank you very much, but we're good. And, and you go, what? And so you, you got to realize that Elisha was wealthy. He didn't want the money. He didn't need the money. He's got his own house. He's got his own servants. And so Elisha's like, I, 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 don't, I don't need your money. I'm, I, this, we're good. So, so far, so good. Now, the servant, however, got greedy. And here's, we pick up the story where the servant Gehazi now is running after Naaman and trying to get something for nothing. Here we go. Go in peace, Elisha said. And Naaman had traveled some distance. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, you know, anytime you say something to yourself and it didn't come from God, are you in trouble? I, I usually am in trouble when I start talking to myself, okay? The man of God said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman. What's he saying? I'm going to get something from this boy. I see an opportunity here. You see, greed is not that you look for opportunities. Greed is when you go to what? You go too far. My master was too easy on naming this Aramean by not accepting from him what he brought. And again, he brought all kinds of stuff in his chariots, gold, silver, sets of clothing. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and I will, I will get something from him. That's terrible leadership. If you're a leader who's always trying to get something from people, you'll get something from them, but it's terrible. The best kind of leaders in this room are you when you have something for people. You become a leader who always has something for people and not something from people, and God will continue to bless you and bless you and bless you. You want to be a leader who has something for people, not like this joker who only wanted something from people. See, people who want something from people, they are greedy. That's good. You're with me. All right. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Everything's all right, but my master sent me to say. Now, did the master send him? What's he doing? He's making up the story, isn't he? He's lying. Now, that's where he goes too far. My master sent me. 
Two young men from the company. Now he's telling a story. Now he's completely fabricating a story to get something from him. Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take, take two talents. Take, take more than what you asked for. And he urged Gehazi to accept them, and then he tied up the two talents of silver in the, with two bags, with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, now he's got to hide what he's done. He took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. And when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha said to him, Well, where have you been, Gehazi? Um, um, I, I didn't go anywhere. I was just hanging out. I went to Starbucks and had a latte and had a bagel at Einstein's. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks or herds or male or female slaves? Naaman's, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. There is a price to pay for greed that's too expensive. Greed is always, always, always too expensive. It costs you far more than you could ever dream or imagine. And in this case, leprosy would never leave Gehazi or his family's descendants. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Wow. And this is why Jesus said these words. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds, plural, all kinds of greed. All right, so how, what do we do? How, how do we get greed out of our heart? Well, we confess it. But it's not, it's not good enough just to get it out of your heart. You've got to put something else inside of your heart. Your heart's got to be filled with something. You get rid of the bad, but you got to fill it with something that's good. And so, again, you can't get everything today, but I want you to get something from this today. First of all, I want us to realize that God just owns it all. We get to be stewards. We get to be conduits of the materials and the resources. First of all, God owns it all. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Do you think that you really own your land? Just stop paying taxes on your land and see who owns it, <laughs> right? About three years from now, you don't own anything. Do, do you own property? Not really. Really, he's saying the land is mine. None of us in this room, though we pay taxes or we've paid it off or we own our house, honestly, we don't even own that. He says the land is mine. Then he says this, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord God Almighty. For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. God is saying, I own everything. You get to manage some things. I own the land. I own the silver. I own the gold. I even own all the animals, all the flocks, the cattle. They're all mine. God says, I know every bird in the mountains. I know even the insects in the field that are mine. God controls every event. He owns every event. God controls every event. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. Do you think that you own anything? You really don't own anything. You get to manage a whole lot of stuff. You don't own squat. Aren't you glad you got up an hour early this morning to come to church? You don't, you don't own anything. It's his, and he controls it. He controls it. And your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. That's what's going to replace greed. It's recognizing that God has given you opportunity. God's given you strength. All we have is a little bit of money, a little bit of time, and a little bit of skill to make a difference the few short years we're on this earth. The Lord does whatever he pleases in the heavens and the earth, in the seas and in all their depths. The Lord directs people's hearts. He owns everything. He controls everything. He even wants to direct your heart. It's amazing. In the Lord's hands are the king's heart. 
In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. Now, the Lord gives godly favor. I like this one. I want you to catch this. The Lord gives godly favor to his people. The Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Everything comes from our God. Everything you have, your lane in life. There's one talent people in this room. There's two talent people in this room. And there's five talent people in this room. It's not whether you're one talent, whether you're two talent, whether you're five talent. That's not the point. The, the point is, he's the one that set you up. He's the one that gave you your lane. He's the one that puts you in the position that you are. Why did God bless you so much? You ever wonder about that? I, I, sometimes Denise and I, when I'm not preaching, she likes to come to church together because we never ever come together and never sit together. And so we'll come in about 9.45 when there's just mass chaos. You're leaving, they're coming in. And Denise and I just look at each other. We go, look at what the Lord has done in spite of us. Do you ever feel that way? All the blessings he's given you, your family, your opportunities, everything comes from God. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Generosity always breaks greed. Everything comes from you. And we've given you only what comes from your hand. What you have and who you are has only come from his hand. What you have, it's because he's given it to you. Now, what we're to do with it is we're to steward it wisely. We're to steward it well. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Now, I want you to catch this. This is amazing. There's three different passages of Scripture that talk about this. If you're godly and if you're holy, he wants to give you more. I know the health and wealth gospel people take this and run with it, and they abuse it. I agree that. They abuse this. But I'm going to just read these, and you can figure it out for yourself. The Lord sometimes transfers wealth from the ungodly to the godly. Now, why would God do that? Why would God take away wealth from the ungodly and why would God give wealth to the godly? Because God has kingdom purposes. God has big things for you to do. Three different sections of Scripture say the same thing. Watch this. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to you. This is a story with Laban, and Laban was dishonest. Seven times Laban changed Joseph's uh, what do you call it, his, his um, paycheck, his um, salary. I make a living communicating his salary. Thank you. Thank you. I'm good with words. Thank you very much. Okay. His salary. Seven times he changed his salary. That's amazing. So God said, I'm done with Laban. I'm going to transfer that wealth to Joseph because I can what? Trust Joseph. Look at this passage at Ecclesiastes. To the person who pleases him, God gives wealth, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. If you please God, is God going to hand over a sinner's wealth to you because they don't please God? That's what Ecclesiastes 2.26 says. I got one more from Proverbs. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for who? I didn't write this. He did. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Don't try to get everything this morning. What? Get, get something, okay? The Lord provides for those who seek and obey Him. It's so encouraging. I don't know how your finances are right now. I don't know. I hope they're great but I know they can be really good if you seek him. James says, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Look what he says. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. God's going to always keep us alive in famine. I'm so amazed with the fear that's in our country and in our world. Fear, 
fear, fear, fear. You know the number one commandment is do not be afraid? You know the commandment that's repeated more than any other time is do not be afraid, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. What have you got to fear? We have a heavenly Father who owns the gold, the silver, the land, the animals. We have a heavenly Father who's in control of all economic systems. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you as well. All right, here's the whole point of this morning. Your heart is only big enough for one God. Your heart is only big enough for one, one God. And you have to decide who that God is going to be. Will it be money? Will it be fame? Will it be success? Will it be, or will it be Jesus Christ? Will it be the Lord God Almighty? Everybody in the room has to choose who will be on his or her throne. And here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to put your ladder on the wrong wall. I've had a front row seat for this for 38 years. I've had a front row seat and I've watched, and you will put your ladder on one of two walls. Everybody should climb the ladder, by the way. I'm all for ladder climbing. Everybody should get better. Everybody should develop more skills. Everybody should get better, and you should be doing that. You should be climbing the ladder. That's a whole other sermon. That's one of the 29 topics on money. But what wall are you going to put your ladder on? And I've watched this. I've watched people chase money and chase, and it's just their insecurities. They're trying to somehow, if I can just get on that wall and get enough greed, and enough stuff, so, somehow I'm going to feel better about myself. And, and, and the, the higher they climb, the louder their insecurities become. And I've, why, I don't want that for you. You place your ladder on the wall of the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. You can be successful. You can do great things. You can be at peace. You can sleep in peace. You can be unencumbered. You can be free to love and serve and help and make a difference. There's only room for one God in your heart. And everybody in the room is going to place their ladder on a wall. Which wall will you place your life? Climb. Climb with Jesus. Listen. Walk. Grow. Let him love you, serve you, work through you. It's the greatest life you could ever have. Dr. Paul Johnson was the chairman of the board of Walk Through the Bible. Now, Dr. John Paul Johnson would always talk about how the wisest people he'd ever met were always thinking about, he would call it the royal bank of heaven. <laughs> and in one of his speeches, he said, you know, the only reason you wouldn't be thinking about and sending money on ahead to the Royal Bank of Heaven is if either A, you weren't planning on going there, or B, you didn't plan on spending very much time there. I just thought that was so funny and so clear. The Royal Bank of Heaven, we're going to be there forever. Put your ladder on the right wall. Stand with me if you would. Let's stand. Let's have our prayer partners come down front. And again, the place to always begin is who's on the throne. We come before you today, O King of kings and Lord of lords. And we come before you today and say we repent. We repent of our greed. We didn't even think we were greedy until this sermon. I didn't think I was greedy until I started the research three weeks ago. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for the greed in my heart and replace it with the power of your Holy Spirit. Forgive all of us in this room. We individually and collectively repent. And we ask you, Lord, just to fill us with the vision of your truth and let us lean our ladder on your wall. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hi, we hope you enjoyed today's message. If this church has impacted you in any way and you'd like to give back, go to harborsidechurch.org give or text Harborside to 77977. Have a great day.